Today in Dave's Garage, we'll go from zero to hero by covering all of the essential knowledge that you need about LED strips of every description. From understanding the various types and styles of strips available, to planning your installation, to actually cutting, connecting, powering, and controlling your new strips. Whether you're looking to add a simple accent light to a bookshelf, or to add animated flames and fireworks to your man cave, this is the video that you need to see. We'll cover both the top five things you need to know as well as the top five mistakes you absolutely should avoid making. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're taking a detailed look at setting up your very first LED strip installation. Now, I love LEDs. My shop features literally thousands of LEDs. In my case, I work primarily with individually addressable strips that allow me to achieve effects like this jet flame, which is something I've applied to installations such as my Tiki Fire Umbrella. I also added hidden strips under the eaves that allow me to put on displays ranging from quiet twinkling to full-on fireworks displays. My shop interior makes extensive use of ambient LED lighting in various colors. But it need not be so complicated. There are several types of strips available, starting with the simplest white LEDs and going all the way on up to the complex, individually addressable color LEDs that we just saw. Let's have a look at the major categories of LED strips so that you know what's out there and how they compare. Tip number one, selecting the right type of strip. The first choice you'll have to make is to decide between a pure white strip, an adjustable color RGB strip, or something that combines both into one for the best of both worlds. The primary categories are all white, all white but with adjustable color temperature, RGB color, RGB color plus white, including some with adjustable color temperature, and RGB individually addressable with or without white options. Now, if you were assuming that you need a color strip or that you should get color just in case you might want it later, consider carefully just how often you'll actually be running your lights in anything other than white. The reality might be that for your application, you really only need a white strip in a suitable color temperature. Most lamps, including LEDs, are rated in terms of degrees Kelvin, with medium numbers like 3000 being a warm white similar to an older 60 watt incandescent bulb. At higher numbers like 5000, things start to take on a bluish tone, a look I've heard to refer to as alien autopsy. At a minimum, it's a crisp and harsh light. An RGB color strip allows you to pick any combination of red, green, and blue. If you do need color and yet don't need individually addressable LEDs, then RGB strips are an excellent solution. They normally feature four wires, power plus a ground for each of the red, green, and blue channels. By varying the voltage or the pulse width of the color inputs, you, or more likely, your little controller box, can mix and match most any color and brightness. Tip number two, use a strip with dedicated white LEDs whenever needed. This type of strip is known as an RGBW, full color plus dedicated white LEDs spaced in between the color ones so that you get the best of both worlds. These feature five wires, red, green, blue, white, and ground. Next up comes RGBWW, which is an RGB strip with both a cold white LED and a warm white LED. This allows you to adjust the base color of the RGB LEDs and also to arbitrarily combine the two colors of white LEDs so that you can match almost any color temperature. Tip number three, using individually addressable LEDs. As noted, individually addressable LEDs, while complicated, are my own personal favorite. They can also be had in combination with the white channel or even with an individually addressable LED plus a tunable white channel, which is about the most flexible strip you can buy. You might think it is best to future-proof by simply buying the most capable strip that you can find, but in addition to costing more, the higher feature strips can also be more complex to deploy and control. And in some cases, like that of an RGB strip without a suitable white channel, you may not be able to get the precise color or look that you are trying to achieve. So be sure to pick the strip that suits your intended application the best, not the one with the most features. Tip number four, selecting the right voltage. Our next big choice is strip voltage. There are three typical choices, five volts, 12 volts, and 24 volts. Your selection will be determined by a few things, such as how often you are willing to re-inject power into your strip installation by supplying a fresh feed. Always refer to your specs or data sheet, but a typical rule of thumb is that the strip shouldn't be asked to carry more than at most about 10 amps anywhere on its own. If you are running 144 LEDs per meter, and they're 60 milliamps each at 5 volts, then each meter of strip is 8 amps. 
So here's a question for you. If each meter uses eight amps and you never want to exceed 10 amps, then I reckon that means you should be injecting new power every two meters so that it never has to travel more than one meter from any injection point. Others would say you need to inject every meter, but I disagree. Let me know what you think in the comments and include your explanation as to why. With a 24 volt strip that is 60 LEDs per meter, you could get away with perhaps as far as 10 meters. It all depends on the milliamps being consumed by the LEDs themselves along the chain. Tip number five, making proper connections. Our final tip relates back to the color style of the strip you selected because that in turn determines the style of connection. The best way to make any connection between strips is with a mechanical soldered joint. When cutting an LED strip, it is important to cut it at the indicated points. This will leave exposed copper pads on each cut end. You should then tin those pads and the wires themselves. Using the connector supplied with the strip, I solder the male end to the strip itself and the female end to the controller. From there, strips can daisy chain up to about a thousand LEDs in length for individually controlled, assuming they are properly powered. A lot of people worry that longer runs will make it harder to propagate that digital signal all the way down to the strip when you're working with individually addressable LEDs, but I don't think this should be an actual concern. From my inspection of the data sheets, and granted I'm not a hardware guy, my conclusion is that the data signal is not merely passed from one LED to the next. Rather, the LED's microcontroller uses the input power supplied in order to regenerate the data signal, and that is passed on at each and every step. Thus, that signal is always fresh and full power, and not just some faded remnant of what you passed in up front initially. If you know whether or not that's the case, please let me know as well. As long as you have proper and sufficient power injected frequently enough, I routinely operate installations with up to a thousand LEDs in a single data segment. Furthermore, I'm even using 3.3 volt signal logic instead of 5 volts and I'm not using a level adapter. The cutoff appears to be 3 volts, so as long as your signal makes it to the very first LED with that much voltage remaining, it will then be repeated at the proper 5 volts by the very first LED. For RGB and similar strips where the entire chain uses the same signal, you can purchase RGB amplifiers and extenders that will take a weak or reduced RGB input signal, freshen it up and amplify it before passing it on down the strip. That in turn should allow you to run a theoretically infinite run of RGB strip. A simple white strip will just have two wires, power and ground. An adjustable color temperature white strip will have two power leads and a ground for a total of three wires. Individually addressable LEDs also have three wires, but they are power, ground, and the digital data. Conventional RGB strips have four wires, a common power lead, and then individual ground legs for the red, green, and blue. RGBW then adds another wire for the white LEDs, giving you a total of five lines. And finally, the adjustable color temperature RGBWW strips have three color, two white, and a ground for a total of six leads in. But why do we care? because the final choices we have to make are related to connecting and mounting our strip. While you could solder the connection from the each strip to the next and form a long, continuous strip, that's a lot of work, and it's a tad air prone with the higher wire count strips. A simpler option is to use end-to-end -end plastic end connectors that feature internal conductors to carry the signal from one LED strip to the next. A strip with three lines would have a connector that also had three internal lines. A strip with five lines needs a connector with exactly five to match, and so on. You cannot get away with the wrong connector, even if it has more lines than needed as they simply wouldn't line up properly anyway. Now that we've covered the basics of LED strip selection, it's time to look at the top mistakes that people tend to make in designing their LED installations. Mistake number one, selecting the wrong style of LED strip. The first big mistake many people make is in using the wrong style of LED strip for their application. As noted earlier, you shouldn't pay for features that you don't need, and using the correct style intended for your application is generally preferable to a do-it-all multicolor extravaganza. If you need a good white and think you might need color periodically, then the RGBW strips that feature both color and white LEDs are your best choice. If you can order them with a color temperature you like out of the box, you're set. Otherwise, if you don't know or you can't find a match for your existing lighting, your best bet would then be a tunable RGBWW strip. The problem with a simple RGB color strip used primarily for white is that it's harder to get a pleasing white color. If you do manage to, they're still less efficient and hence will use more power and produce more heat. So I discourage you from trying to do interior white lighting with a color RGB strip unless it also has a dedicated white LED channel. Now as much fun as they are, you should avoid individually addressable LEDs entirely unless you're comfortable using either a pre-made effects controller box of some kind from Amazon or a software solution like Night Driver or WLED. 
With individually addressable LEDs, each one contains a tiny integrated circuit that reads the incoming data stream, sets its own color accordingly, and then passes the data onto the next LED in the chain. Unlike an RGB strip where everything is the same color, each and every LED element can be different, and the signal is digital, not analog. As a result, individually addressable LEDs can perform some incredibly intricate and impressive effects, but they require additional work and knowledge. Check this channel for other videos that cover individually addressable LEDs in great detail, and please do make sure you're subscribed to the channel for all the latest LED news, tips, and updates. Mistake number two, improper mounting and connection. Our next mistake relates back to our final tip, proper connection and mounting. There are two things to avoid, mounting your strips with directly visible LEDs or mounting them with hot spots or cold spots. In most cases, ideally at least, you never want to see the LED elements themselves. You want the LEDs to cast their light indirectly onto a surface so they appear more diffuse and less like a series of point lights. When casting this indirect light, it is important to keep the number of LEDs per inch relatively constant. Having clusters of additional LEDs due to strip looping or gaps in your routing will turn into hot spots and cold spots, which means areas with too much or too little brightness. One notorious cause of hot spots and cool spots is attempting to turn a 90 degree corner. You are much better off using a corner connector with the right number of conductors for your strip. First, you cut the strip as directed at one of the designated cut lines, normally indicated by the presence of copper solder pads. Next, you crimp the connector down onto the strip and the internal conductors of the connector route all the lines from one strip to the next. Two other essential styles of connector are the wired flexible connector and the wired extension cable, which is the same idea, only longer. Corner connectors are especially handy for the backs of TVs and other areas where you want a 90 degree bend. Although it's possible to do it by looping the strip around on itself, I don't recommend it. If you can't suitably hide the LEDs from view, consider a channel. They're usually formed from an extruded aluminum and are available in silver, white, and black. They can be easily cut to length with standard hand tools like a hacksaw. In addition to the standard wall mount strip style, you can also purchase 45 degree corner strip, which nicely angles the strip down and towards you. Both styles of channel can be equipped with clear or translucent plastic covers that will help protect the LEDs and that further diffuse the light that they produce. I also recommend that you stagger your seams so that the seam between aluminum channels does not align with seams between strips. Make sure you do not remove the insulating adhesive from the back of the strip and that you cover any exposed solder pads when you do mount your strip in the conductive aluminum channel. You don't want a short circuit. For maximum diffusion, consider these silicone gel style strips that encapsulate the LEDs within a cord that lights up almost like a neon tube. Mistake number three, wrong pixel density. Our next big mistake is using strips of the wrong density. The lowest density that I've seen is 30 LEDs per meter. The highest density in color strips seems to be 144 pixels per meter, which appears all but continuous from as little as 10 feet away, but you'd have to be fairly far away from a 30 or 60 per meter strip to not see it as a series of discontinuous dots. Mistake number four, overheating and waterproofing. Our next big problems come in the form of heat, which is one of the big enemies of the LED. The higher the density and the greater the brightness, the more heat, and heat kills LEDs. One excellent solution is to use that aluminum channel, which acts like a big heatsink to wick excess heat away. Conversely, mounting your strip to an insulator like wood will mean it's that much harder for the LEDs to shed heat and it can shorten their lifespan significantly. A related concern is waterproofing. Every strip will have an IP rating composed of two digits, like 6-7. The first digit indicates how well sealed the strip is against dust and 6 is the highest rating. It's the second digit though that's of more interest to us because it is the waterproofing indication. The rating scale ranges from 0, no protection, to 9K that would, in theory, survive a pressure washer, but our strips don't go that high. At one extreme, we have strips that expose their bare PCBs and that have no waterproofing whatsoever. They're called IP30. In the middle, we have strips that have their electronics covered in a silicone coating, which is enough protection for an LED that will be outdoors, but not directly in the weather, perhaps within a covered channel and protected by an eave like my own. Stepping up to IP67 waterproofing encapsulates the entire strip within a transparent waterproof tube. Now you can't use it in your pool, but it is rated down to 1 meter for 30 minutes, so it'll withstand any wet weather you can throw at it. Mistake number 5. Power supply issues. One common problem is attempting to use 5 volt LEDs for long runs of several meters, but you just can't push 5 volts that far. Unless you're going to re-inject power every meter or two, you should really consider 12 volt or 24 volt strips where a few volts of drop won't be a deal breaker. Even with my own strips, I have a 5 volt installation run alongside a 24 volt bus and I use buck converters to inject fresh 5 volts every 2 meters. 
The common problem then is attempting to use low voltage LEDs for long runs. Long runs and higher power use will need power re-injected every time the voltage drop is too high. The lower the starting voltage, the more sensitive it is to that drop. A 5 volt circuit that loses 3 volts will be inoperative, whereas a 24 volt system with a 3 volts of drop will continue to work just fine, probably. Another common problem is attempting to use a power supply with not enough watts or amps. The rated voltage must match exactly with the strip, but the amperage or watts may be higher than what you need without a problem, it just can't be lower. Wall warts or power bricks can be used up to somewhere around 50 watts, and then you need a dedicated line power supply which can be any wattage, but they are commonly available up to about 500 watts. It's generally good practice to allow yourself about 20% headroom. A 100 watt supply then shouldn't really be asked to do more than about 80 watts of load. Do me one favor, don't use these anywhere that kids or curious fingers can get near them. They feature exposed wiring terminals and must be enclosed in a proper insulated enclosure if exposed to regular humans, or dogs, or whatever. Remember that if your controller and your strip are different voltages, then only the grounds between them are shared. Thus, if you were connecting a 12 volt strip to a 5 volt controller, you'd need a 12 volt power supply for the strip and a 5 volt power supply for the controller. And of course, those two could never touch their positives, but the grounds would be shared between them. They do make supplies that feature both 5 and 12 volts, however, for your convenience. I've put Amazon affiliate links in the video description with the most common parts that I've found myself using, from strips to power supplies to connectors and clips. I've done the homework so you can do the shopping and the lighting. I'm only listing parts and brands that I've used myself and that I personally recommend. If you've enjoyed this episode, this channel also features dozens of other LED videos, tutorials, and projects. So by all means, please ensure that you're subscribed to the channel so you'll see any follow-up episodes on mounting, installation, and programming your LEDs. This is especially important if you've not seen one of my videos before, as otherwise I might be gone forever. And neither one of us wants that kind of existential crisis on our conscience. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, ASD, Asperger's, or if you just want more stories from my old Microsoft days, please check out my book, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's available on Amazon now, and you can read the sample chapter for free, and the full ebook is on sale for under 10 bucks, so please check it out. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Are you subscribed yet? This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.